Hello everybody, you're welcome to Title Tuesday, a show for those who want to improve in chess. Today I'm going to um, introduce my personal vision of the problem of improvement in chess and I'm going to uh, show you one interesting game that was played uh, between Vladimir Kramnik and Veselin Topalov one year ago. Uh, besides being a modern masterpiece, a positional masterpiece, this game is also um, quite suitable in view of our goals. So to present the problem of improvement and to come up with some tips on this topic. So let's get to uh, chess content. And let us start. So uh, Kramnik started normally with the d4, his main uh, opening choice. Uh, knight f6, knight f3, and after e6, instead of playing something really ambitious, uh, he played e3. Uh, a bit strange move uh, for the player like Kramnik, probably, at, but only at first sight. So uh, the question here is, uh, what is the main reason for choosing such a non-ambitious uh, opening line? So according to Kramnik, um, he played this opening line to that moment uh, already in several uh, blitz and rapid games and uh, had a good uh, success, has had a great success in that. And actually Topalov uh, didn't see those games. So uh, this opening choice uh, appeared uh, as a surprise to him. So his opening preparation was completely destroyed. And usually uh, when your opponent faces such a problem, uh, he appears under serious uh, psychological pressure, uh, which means uh, he starts being nervous a bit, he starts uh, thinking a lot, so uh, spending a lot of time, uh, which may lead to a time trouble. Uh, so actually it is already some sort of advantage to surprise your opponent. Uh, not a big surprise that Tepalov uh, eventually came up with the not very successful order of moves. So he played c5. After bishop d3, uh, he answered with the b6. So as we can see, uh, everything goes to some sort of a version of Queen's Indian defense. However, uh, we should know that in Queen's Indian defense, uh, black usually uh, doesn't hurry up with the c5 move. So uh, black usually wants to uh, develop his pieces first, then probably to play d5 if possible, and only then when everything is prepared to play c5. So that makes a difference here. Castles, bishop goes to b7, and white naturally continues with the c4, preparing knight c3 with the occupation of the center. So already here black has some problems, because white's plan is clear, he wants to play knight c3 and then probably even play in d5. So sometimes in such a pawn structure, this pawn sacrifice if it is a sacrifice, of course, uh, makes, makes sense because it leads to a very promising pawn structure. So here Topalov uh, took on d4 with the idea of undermining uh, the center with the help of d5 next. So after e takes and bishop e7, knight c3, he played exactly d5. So here we can see that uh, the main threat of d4, d5 is prevented and inevitably uh, we will achieve a position with the isolated queen's pawn on d4. Uh, because it doesn't matter if white takes on d5 or black takes on c4, so this pawn will arise. Uh, it is a vulnerable pawn, however, that is a typical uh, position in which if white manages to save as much resources as he can and uh, come up with some sort of active play, he usually has a very nasty initiative. So. Let's see what happens if, for example, black uh, doesn't play d5 and continues with the natural castling. Also an interesting continuation, but here white exactly has a chance to play d5. Grabbing the space and the point here that pawn on d5 is invulnerable. Let's see. If takes, then takes, for example, knight takes d5, knight takes d5, bishop takes d5, and white immediately wins the pawn back after bishop h7. And let's see, king takes, queen takes on d5. White has a clear advantage here. Because of the pawn structure, first of all, we can see that black now has an isolated pawn. 
moreover, it is not on d5, but on d7. It is very hard to improve its position since white has great blockade and resources. And pay attention to the king. So after h7 went away from the board, uh, the king is kind of exposed. So in addition to play against this vulnerable pawn, white has interest in chances to come up with some sort of the attack uh, on the king side. So here white is clearly better, which means that d5 here uh, was more or less forced. Kremnik uh, immediately clarifies the pawn structure, so he takes on d5, forcing knight takes d5. Since taking with the e6 pawn uh, will be sort of mistake, because after that bishop b7 will be really uh, passive. Uh, if bishop takes on d5, well, white can uh, also think of just taking the bishop on d5 and uh, achieving pair of bishops, so it might be dangerous for black. So knight d5 looks like the most natural continuation and it was actually played. White also continued in a natural way, so knight goes to e5. That is a good out pause for the knight, since uh, here the knight is centralized, it exerts direct pressure on black's um, most vulnerable points, such as f7, for example. Uh, it uh, makes not so simple for black to continue development in many cases. And why this position is so great? Because actually uh, black has no real chance to play f6, since f6 uh, really weakens position. e6 becomes a dead weakness and white has a chance to attack it and so on. So f6 is very dubious decision here. So. All this means knight on e5 is for a long time. After castling, queen also jumps to g4. So as I said before, white's main plan here is to come up with the attack on the king side, right? So uh, this means white has to concentrate majority of his pieces on the king side. So getting closer to opponent's king. So after playing uh, queen g4, uh, Kramnik actually uh, created some sort of uh, nasty uh, threat of bishop h6, that is the main threat at the moment. Uh, so the idea is very simple, to exert pressure on g7 and to force it moving, for example. So, for instance, knight d7, a normal development move will be a mistake in the view of bishop h6. Now g6 leads to bishop f8. So the only possibility to protect g7 and not to lose the material is bishop to f6. But as you can see, the bishop occupies a position which is usually occupied by the knight, uh, which means that there is no enough defense uh, of the h7 square. So white can continue with the queen e4, creating a threat of queen h7 checkmate, which finally forces g6 move. And after bishop takes f8, white has a material advantage. So. After queen g4, uh, as you can see, position is already uh, quite dangerous for black, not very pleasant to protect. Uh, so black has to be uh, extremely careful. And uh, the most natural idea here is to do something with the queen, right? Because queen is the most dangerous piece here. Um, one of possible moves here is knight to f6. So after that, queen goes to h4, uh, exerting pressure on h7, as you can see. And now white's plan is very simple. So white wants to continue development with probably aggressive move bishop to g5, creating a sort of taking on f6 and then getting to h7 with a checkmate, or at least a dangerous attack. Uh, if black makes a concession on the king side, playing something like h6, in many cases it will be possible for white just to sacrifice the bishop there on h6, a typical idea here, uh, coming up with some sort of a uh, attack with the help of the rook lift. So, for example, rook through e1 goes to e3 and then gets to the open g file or something like that. So, h6 will be really dangerous to play. But in this position, black uh, has a choice uh, which is quite uh, tempting but at the same time quite dangerous. It is knight to e4. Attacking the queen. Uh, as you can see, knight on the e4 is protected by the bishop, so queen can't take the knight. And at the same time, uh, we can see that knight on e4 breaks the connection between the queen and the pawn on d4. So next move, after queen retreats, uh, black can take on d4. 
So after natural queen h3, uh, saving the queen on this uh, dangerous file, h file, queen takes d4, attacking the knight, and at the same time supporting knight e4, uh, white can continue with bishop to f4. And this position is rather unclear. So to that moment, uh, it happened only in one game of Antonetta Stefanova. So that was uh, a draw. Uh, however, during all the game, uh, white had an unpleasant pressure on black's position, having the initiative and uh, great attacking prospects. So Kramnik definitely was prepared for this uh, scenario and uh, had something up his sleeve. So um, probably Topalov understood this possibility exists, but uh, it was extremely dangerous to get to this position since it was clear that Kramnik was better prepared to this game and uh, definitely analyzed this position in depth. So just to show you uh, possible variations here, after knight f6 uh, going away and protecting h7 pawn, white continues with the knight e2, very concrete move attacking the queen and preparing uh, some improvement of that knight through f4. For example, queen goes away, bishop g5, again creating a concrete threat of taking on f6 and then taking on h7, which literally forces g6 move. White can continue with the bishop h6 here. Uh, and then, for example, after rook e1, knight f4, white has a lot of different threats. Despite being a pawn less, uh, white definitely has um, an upper hand here. So knight f7 or knight e6 are in the air. Uh, so different combinations based on sacrificing minor pieces on the king side. So let's just count. So we have a queen, the knight, another knight, the bishop, and another bishop, and the rook actually just attacking on the king side. So it is a great advantage in the quantity of resources there. So that is rather dangerous. Uh, however, uh, probably this uh, was Black's best option. Uh, and uh, definitely this position deserves further uh, analysis and practice to understand uh, the real evaluation. So in the game, after queen g4, uh, Tapal decided to solve the problem of this active queen and uh, great threats to h7, g7, with the help of um, very active, but at the same time, uh, quite dubious move. So he played f5, uh, completely closing diagonal uh, b1, h7. So we can see there is nothing to do with the queen on the king side anymore. However, uh, this move has a serious drawback. As you can see, pawn e6 can't be protected with pawns from adjacent files, so it became a weakness. And after queen e2 and bishop to f6, uh, it's very uh, useful to follow uh, Kramnik's consideration of this position. So Kramnik says, it is obvious that white has an enduring initiative. It is no longer possible to call the d4 pawn an isolated one since it is no weaker than e6 pawn. Uh, I was happy with the outcome of the opening. Yes, uh, definitely, he managed to surprise Topalov and at the same time uh, to come up with the better position out of the opening. Uh, also, probably forcing Topalov to spend a lot of time in this stage of the game. So now it is a good moment to make uh, a break and come up with some tips on the opening preparation because remember uh, our main goal today is to understand the general problem of improvement in chess. So a few seconds I will share uh, my tips with you and we will go through them. So the first tip is play solid which means choose normal openings but not necessarily main or most popular lines. These lines should go hand in hand with general principles, actually. So that is the main idea. So to choose normal uh, and not dubious from a strategical point of view openings uh, and to play them, just to play solid. The second tip is to think middle games, which means uh, learn typical plans of middle games that arise in your opening lines. If you don't like the spirit of the position, then you have to avoid this opening line at all. 
when you learn uh, middle games that arise uh, from your opening lines, so when you learn typical uh, positions there, when you learn typical plans, you are much better prepared so you uh, spend less time during the game and uh, that means you have more time for making normal decisions, effective decisions uh, in critical moments of the game. And what is your main goal? Uh, it is to get comfortable middle game positions that you know pretty well and understand at least not worse than your opponent. In this case, uh, you will have uh, great chances to win the game or at least not to lose it, right? So the best scenario, of course, is to surprise your opponent just like Kramnik did uh, in his game. However, it doesn't mean that uh, you have to choose dubious opening lines to do that. Because your main goal is to get comfortable, normal middle game position that you know pretty well and understand at least not worse than your opponent. So your goal is not to win the game in an opening. So sometimes it happens, of course, but only when you play to a lower rated player or at least uh, a player who uh, knows nothing about this opening line. But uh, believe me, if you will choose uh, dubious opening lines on a regular basis, uh, soon, sooner or later you will be not satisfied with your results because opponents will start um, preparing to you. It is very hard to surprise your opponents every time, believe me. Uh, so it's better to stick to normal openings. The best scenario, of course, is to surprise, but uh, if it doesn't happen, no worries. You, you just have a normal middle game position uh, and you've learned already uh, typical plans. Um, so you are ready just to continue the game in the middle game stage and to try to win it. Okay, and that were tips on openings preparation and choosing the correct opening. And I guess now it's time to get back to our game and to see what happened next. So, uh, in this position, uh, Kramnik played a uh, very natural move, bishop c4. Improving the position of the bishop, because um, since pawn is on f5, uh, it's not uh, so easy to prove that bishop uh, makes anything useful on that diagonal b1, h7. So it's better to improve its position. And now, as you can see, after uh, bishop appeared on c4, white started exerting more pressure on black's main weakness, it is e6 pawn, preventing, for example, moves of the knight at the moment. If knight moves away somewhere, then e6 is hanging and white wins. Black also reacted with the rook to e8, normal move protecting e6 pawn, it's necessary to do prior to continuing development. Uh, Kramnik played rook to d1. Uh, it is very important uh, not to forget about your weaknesses as well. So d4 is kind of vulnerable pawn and uh, it's better to protect it somehow. So rook goes to d1 to support the pawn to prevent some attacks against this pawn. Um, so uh, another idea behind playing rook to d1 is that, uh, for example, if black takes on e5 at some point, then after d takes on e5, uh, d file becomes open and white already occupied it. Uh, why it is so necessary to think of opening of the d file and this exchange on e5? Actually, uh, it's very... Uh, easy to understand. Knight on e5 is really great. It is an annoying piece, so it controls so many important squares. When the pawn was on f7, despite being dubious decision, it was still possible to uh, get rid of the knight with the help of f6. So now when the pawn is on f5, the only possibility to get rid of the knight on e5 is to try uh, to exchange it somehow, which means to take it with the bishop or maybe with the knight. Uh, Black will do it anyway. At some point because uh, believe me it's very hard to uh, be patient uh, when you face such a great knight on e5 that's why it, it makes sense just to prepare for that in advance rook is already on d1 so white is ready to take it on e5 and what is interesting uh, according to uh, Kramnik's annotations to this game uh, this position was still a part of his preparation just amazing um, how deeply he prepares his opening lines but he's a top player so it's uh, predicted. Uh, so after rook d1, uh, for example, 
if black continues with the uh, normal knight to c6 move, which looks natural to complete a development, to exert some pressure on e5, on d4, and so on. Uh, white uh, can continue with the interest in transformation. So knight takes on d5 first, which looks strange uh, because it activates black's rook. And we can see that black already has uh, several attackers uh, of the knight e5, right? So e takes on d5, attacking the bishop. So the bishop goes away, then it's possible to capture on e5 and to win a pawn. But it appears that white has a chance not to go away with the bishop, to leave it hanging, and just to support the knight with the help of f4 move. Appears that black, uh, black can't take on c4, so if takes, then it leads to a, a famous pattern of the smothered mate. So queen takes, as you can see, this diagonal is completely weak, and black has no chance to um, limit the activity of the queen here to uh, block his king somehow. So after king h8, knight f7, and this sequence of moves, white comes up with this nice checkmate. Uh, to black's king. So after f4, it's not possible uh, to take the bishop, which means the knight on e5 is protected, and uh, white will have a chance to go away with the bishop at any moment, maybe next move, for example. So let's see, queen d6, and bishop goes to b3. And again, uh, what Kramnik says about this position. There is no way the knight uh, to reach e4, whereas white can do what he wants and in time he will begin play on the king side. The bishop on b7 is bad, as we can see it is limited with the pawn, and white has a clear positional advantage. Um, it's very hard to disagree because um, definitely white has great chances to exploit the power of the knight. e5 here, so for black it is now a very um, unpleasant to capture on e5 uh, with either the knight or the bishop, because white will recapture with the d4 pawn, in which case uh, white will have a protected passed pawn on the e-file, and at the same time a great pressure against d5 pawn. So knight c6 uh, looks dubious in the view of this, knight e5 takes and f4. In a game, uh, Topalov played knight e7, and starting from here Kramnik had to make decisions over the board, which is, of course, the most interesting part um, of our today's show. So we want to understand how top grandmasters make decisions and we want to come up with some tips on improvement of this process.